Welcome, folks, to The Uncommon Good with Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr. Every week, diving deep into the truth of Catholic social teaching and restoring all things in Christ. The Uncommon Good is on the air. I'm Bo Bonner. And I'm Dr. Bud Marr. We are broadcasting from the KY Iowa Catholic Radio Mercy One Studios here on this uh snowy Wednesday here in Des Moines, Iowa. I'm over here in Des Moines, like I said, uh, winter wonderland all this time in uh, April after Easter, where I am the director of mission and ministry at Mercy College and Health Sciences and the executive vice president of the Newman Idea. You can check all that out at mchs.edu and newmanidea.org. But out there in Pittsburgh, uh, how's the weather and what are you up to? So it's uh, it's sunny and bright today, but qu- quite cold. I think most of the Midwest is um, working through this. But I- I'm here at the National Institute for Newman Studies, and you can find out about our work at uh, newmanstudies.org. Yeah, um, I I am genu- genuinely impressed about how cold it is. We uh, I think it was four years ago, five years ago. Um, it was actually the first year that I was living up in Des Moines, but uh, my family was still back in Wichita. They had moved up with me. So I was in Wichita for Easter and it snowed on Easter Day. And I think we were like, well, that's weird and probably will never happen again. And now it didn't quite snow right on Easter, bud, but Easter week snowing multiple times and then basically, uh, you know, Nebraska and Iowa and, and everybody just dealing with uh, snow and cold weather. That was that was kind of a surprise that the Easter Bunny left on our uh, tables. <laughs> yeah, it's been kind of a strange experience the last twenty four hours in my household because you know we've had um, all, the, all the drama and the news and the crisis that our country is going through lately. Uh, but my kids, they've been mostly like blissfully ignorant, and you don't really want to like give running you know COVID nineteen reports to your young children. But once the weather turned cold, they're kind of like. What have we done to anger God? You know, like it's really, <laughs> it's really the cold weather that uh, my children are struggling through right now. That was <laughs> that was just the the cherry on top of the what's going on with twenty twenty pie. That's a good point. Yeah, no, I mean, there we we Rachel and I are really homebodies, and we homeschool and everything. So the actual change in routine for most of the country for my children has been been pretty slight. But once the cold weather drove us indoors, you know, it was a new bridge to cross. That's right. With uh, the Mar household, I can report to everyone that when they say they're homebodies, that means their house, the entire yard, probably most of the neighborhood. Uh, I think, you know, (laughs) half of your children would just like sleep in the grass outside and be there all day. So, yeah, for it to to be snowing or just this cold can uh, really uh, make uh, make April seem like it jumped the shark for the Mar children. And I think most of us are are on this with them. So uh, solidarity, Mar, ch- Mar children, this is, this is now officially completely weird. And uh, I, I agree with that. Yeah, right before the show started, I actually saw um, a report online that it's the coldest April 15th in 150 years in Omaha. So, I mean, you see stats like that, and it's just kind of one of those crazy things. So, yeah, God's, <laughs> God's speed, stay warm. That's right. Here we are. <laughs> well, um, what one piece, <laughs> it, it's hard to transition that because like, I think I could talk about like how weird this weather has been like, uh, uh for a complete hour, but that would be boring yeah. for the listeners. So we'll move on, uh, w- w- as always underwritten by mercy college of health sciences, mchs.edu. Yes. Still signing up students. We got people who are gearing up for a summer semester and uh, of course the fall, uh, folks, you know, you, we all know what we're dealing with. These sort of unprecedented times and, we talking about the unprecedented times. We talk about the unprecedented heroes of those working the front lines in the medical industry, especially nurses and allied health. And that's what Mercy College trains people to do: is the next line of people doing heroic work to help us. Not only obviously with COVID, uh, but like wh- whatever else uh, is coming up. So mchs.edu to check that out if you want to maybe uh, change fields or start a new career or start this be your first one about helping people when they need it and where they need it most. Yeah, that's right, Bo. Just speaking personally, I know I can go through my life and just kind of take for granted that certain realities are there. So if I get up and sick, you know, I expect to be able to go to to urgent care and have that all available and everything. But I think the news, recent news has really 
shine the light on just um, how important you know it is to have uh, quality medical care, but also one that I we would hope was informed by the truths of our faith. So good stuff at Mercy College. That's right. God bless all of our former students who are out there uh, listening in the medical field. We're proud of you guys. Today uh, on the show, we have one of the most established uh, Uncommon Good All-Stars, Mr. Brandley, Brandon McGinley, who's been on the show quite a bit. A prolific writer. Uh, you can go to brandonmcginley.com and check out all the different places that he's written. He's had some trenchant commentary on what we're facing, not only with uh, the COVID crisis, but for t- uh, the economic crisis. And also, what does that have to say about how we order society? And, uh, you know, what does what does it mean for us to sort of make a bridge uh, between um, keeping death at its door, but making sure not to be too afraid to live uh, over at Mere Orthodoxy? He's actually had two recent articles that sort of deal with both uh, of these issues about fear and life and death. Uh, it's great stuff. So we're glad to have him back on the show. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So, uh, yeah, BrandonMcGinley.com, uh, Mere Orthodoxy, uh, for the, the latest two that he's written, one on the perpetual motion machine, the other on the Pope's Irby at Orby uh, talk. Uh, it's nice to, to be here speaking with you guys uh, during the Easter week and the Easter octave. I have to say, for everything considered, our family had a beautiful Easter uh, Sunday. I hope that was true for all of you as well. Uh, so we're looking forward to getting back up on the horse of the Uncommon Good and talking to you. And so Brandon McGinley is a wonderful guest to have to restart all this up. So for Bud and Bo, this is the Uncommon Good, and we're going to be back right after these messages. We're back with the Uncommon Good. Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Mar joining you on this, well, brisk Wednesday, (laughs) at least in the middle of the country here. So good to have you back listening to us. Happy Easter, everyone. Make sure that you are enjoying the feast. As weird and difficult and new as the situation is, please make sure to be feasting because this is the feast of our Lord. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Today on the show, we have perhaps one of the most all-starriest of Uncommon Good All-Star. He's been on the show multiple times. Brandon McGinley writes about faith, culture, and politics from his hometown of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He has written for the National Review, the Human Life Review, Fair Forward, Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, Harrisburg Patrick, uh, Patriot News, uh, First Things Public Discourse of the Week. We're talking about two articles that he's had on MereOrthodoxy.com. Brandon McGinley, thanks for coming back on the show. Hey, Bo. How you doing? Wonderful. It's glad. It's good to hear your voice. And like I said, happy Easter. <laughs> I hope that Thank all you. things considered, you had uh, you know a good Easter uh, with your family. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's been great. I mean, like, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned, uh, you know, to focus on feasting because, you know, it's easy to just kind of... One of the nice things, honestly, about all this happening during this time of year has been that the Lent and Easter and Palm Sunday, we're in a deeply liturgical time of year that allows us to keep track of the days. <laughs> things, And it's important to do what we can to make sure the days don't just blend together. <clears throat> no, that's absolutely true. I will say that, so one of the things that's thrown us for a loop is so... Um, just a little, you know, advice out there for, you know, all you new dads, which would not include Brandon or Bud, but you, you, you got a trick for everybody. During Holy Week, if you convince your family to pray Tenebrae, which is incredibly long, after uh-huh. that, all the all the other offices of the church seem really short. And so they're like, sure, Vespers, <laughs> Compline, whatever. Uh, the problem is uh, for Easter, because to show that the church believes that like the whole next eight days is all celebration, you pray the Sunday Psalms every day. And so now they think that like, you know, there's just that now they're, they're wondering about, you know, dad's, you know, ideas here about stuff. But I'm with you. It's been a deeply liturgical time. And if there's a week that you need to confuse every day with Sunday, it should be this one uh, because yeah. of the, what's going on. Um, Brandon, so like I said, you, you you've written two very timely articles one on the Irby at Orby speech uh, that the Pope uh, gave of course uh, in Lent not too long ago and then one about what you're calling the perpetual motion machine which I think is a wonderful way to put um, the sort of issues that we're dealing with about um, what what uh, what happens when something like COVID-19 um, comes into our lives and puts a halt to what the normal is but underneath all of those I think that the real theme is about fear 
uh, and the multiple, the multifaceted ways that fear uh, drive us to do things both uh, prudent and imprudent. Um, yeah. So, I, you know, before we get into the, the details of all of these things, it's, it's obvious why fear and the discussion of fear would sort of be at the forefront of a lot of people's minds dealing with such a new and different situation. Uh, I guess what I want to ask is, do you think when it comes to sort of politics and theology and how we organize our community, do you think people kind of overlook the role that that sort of elemental fear plays in humans organizing their lives? Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good question. You know, um, you know, when I wrote about when I wrote about the, the pandemic, I wanted to I wanted to articulate a, a point of view that that was understanding of and supportive of the hopefully rather temporary measures that are being taken right now, but also one that did not that recognized that there is a certain amount of irrational fear, not not necessarily in the sense of not necessarily in the sense of uh, the virus itself, but in the sense of um, we are so conditioned to think that in the year of our Lord 2020, everything is supposed to be safe. That um, the way I described it in the article is that we, we felt like we had reached a kind of equilibrium with death. You know, old people died, and that was natural, and there's nothing to be done about that. And when young people died, it was a tragedy, and we had minimized that as best we could, such that the average person does not live in regular fear of imminent demise. Um, and so when something comes up that, you know, that tweaks, it, it's not, it's, this isn't like a Spanish flu kind of thing where we're dealing with, you know, with, um, young, strong people, you know, dropping left and right, but it tweaks our, our equilibrium. It makes our, our, our view of the safety of our world a little bit different. And, um, and so I think that it goes to show the extent to which the our whole arrangement of our lives has been about trying to keep death at bay in a way that has become normal for us. We don't even realize we're doing it. It's 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 uh, it's just assumed. It's like uh, it's like the classic thing about the, the a fish doesn't realize he's swimming in water because it's just the way it's always been. We've we've always lived in a civilization that through science and even through our political arrangements, has um, very successfully uh, tried to forget about death. Um, but now here it is again. And on the one hand, we want to recognize that we're embodied creatures and death is bad, and we want to avoid it. But at the same time, we also recognize that uh, the point of making big changes right now isn't to live in constant fear of the new virus, but to get to a point where we can live with a new reality, come to a new equilibrium, a probably more dangerous equilibrium, one where there is more risk, where we're going out to a, uh, a restaurant or to a hockey game or to something comes with a tinge of, of, of anxiety that maybe wasn't there before. But that's part of life, too. You know, there's no, there's no perfectly safe way of living. Hey, Brandon, this is Bud, and I have to say off the bat, uh, it's good to hear your voice. Um, yeah. <laughs> we, for, for our listeners, Brandon and I, and I live just, um, what would you say, like six or seven miles apart? And yep. um, yeah, attend the same parish, but uh, it kind of feels like you're on the other side of the country right now. So part of having you on this show was just selfish on my part. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's great. I'm, I'm glad. I'm, I'm, I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad you did it because it's it's nice to have a. It's nice to have a. Even though we're 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 doing it over the phone over the radio, it's nice to have a, a conversation like this. It's not being typed yeah. on a computer. <laughs> so I I found your article in Mirror Orthodoxy really challenging. It got my mind turning, and I I like the fact that you um didn't just stick with the pandemic, but but got to some more foundational um conversation around even how we organize our lives and especially the economy and uh yeah. feel free to, to to push back against this idea but in conversations with friends especially like text threads that i have going and things um i feel sometimes like the conversation gets bogged down in the question of the economy and of course uh, I, I think your article even touched on some of this 
but we've seen this idea used in really poor ways during the pandemic. So yeah. some will say like, we, we kind of just have to sacrifice lives for the sake of the economy. Right. Um, and then others rightfully, I think, jump in and say like, um, no, I'm not saying that sort of thing, but like economic concerns are real and they affect everyday lives. And so we can't just bracket them, et cetera. Right. And I guess what I've been thinking about is as Catholics, how do we see that question through the lens of faith? So I feel like in public discourse, the term the economy is used in equiv equivocal ways. So sometimes yeah. it means like the stock market. Sometimes it means like um, buyer confidence or consumer habits. And then other times it means, you know, like how much uh, a laborer earns and do they have a fair wage? And so yeah. I mean, how, how as Catholics should we talk about the economy and what are some, way, some, some sort of like traps we should avoid? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I, I think, you know, one of the things I wanted to get at in writing this was to deal with the, the reality of the fact that anything, anytime there's a pandemic, not that, not that we had too much experience with this kind of thing, but it's going to have economic consequences. So our mitigation measure, measures are having economic consequences. I think some people understate the extent to which just letting the virus go would have economic consequences. We're already seeing now with with major mitigation efforts, we're seeing food processing facilities shut down because the virus gets in there and you have hundreds of people getting it. That would be happening 10, 20 times over if we weren't doing these things. And we're looking at that's major economic consequences. So I, I think, first of all, there, it's not a question of of uh, virus death or economic death. It's, it's, it's a question of what what balance of the two or what, what, what basket of the two we select and trying to minimize both. But putting that to one side, um, I think that if we're, when we're talking about the economic consequences of, of this, it's important not to speak as if the, the economic arrangement to which we're accustomed is completely normative and natural. I think that's something actually potentially, you know, in a way good to come out of this is giving us an opportunity to step outside of the way things have always been for basically all of our lives and look at it from the outside. Now, at the same time, this is one of the reasons it's so hard to talk about, precisely because this is the way things have always been and the way things are now, there are real human costs to messing with it. And so at the same time that I want to say that, you know, realistically, this is a great opportunity to, to, to say, like, maybe we don't need um, so many stores to be open 16, 18, 24 hours a day. Maybe we don't need the kind of economic volume, consumerist volume of transactions that we're used to. Maybe we actually, you know, the way things are right now is probably, you know, it's not, it's not good. But it also maybe wasn't necessarily ideal the way things were, where where it was just what it was described as perpetual motion, and and if and if, and if the, the the health of our society and if and if um, the livelihood of of the, the the lower classes depends entirely on this kind of perpetual motion where everybody is consuming at all times then maybe that wasn't a great state of affairs. Maybe if, if we can't, if we, if, if, if a, I just saw today, it was like an 8.7% drop in retail activity, retail sales in March. If an 8.7 drop in retail sales in one month is catastrophic, then maybe that says something about actually, you know, how fragile uh, a perpetual motion arrangement is. Um, and so, Rather than, there, there's the crash utilitarianism of um, we just have to sacrifice people to keep, to, keep them, to, keep, to keep the machine moving, okay? There's that, and I've seen it, but that's not the, that's not the dominant argument. The dominant argument is, is, um, is more subtle. But it still assumes that the way things were is the way things should be and should go back to being. Um, and I think that's a mistake. I think that there's, there's, we can look at this situation and say, hmm, maybe, maybe that perpetual motion uh, wasn't actually humane. Um, well, and, yeah, no, uh, 
But that requires that's not it's not a small thing. That's a radical thing to say because it, you know when I say oh a lower volume economy, you have to figure out something to, for all the people who depend on being you know mi- um, minimum wage clerks at two a.m. at Walmart to do if, if Walmart's not open twenty four hours. So I mean there's there but but, but it, it seems the whole thing seems suggestive to me that the assumed arrangement. Was was maybe not uh, not not as natural and humane as we thought it was. Well, right, and to, to your point, to to operate at such thin margins, not like here and there, or not by necessity. I mean, I think, I think that's what right. you're getting at is to say it's one thing to go like, well, humans by nature have a thin margin, i.e., if you don't eat after a while, you're dead, right? You know, so <laughs> right, right. there's some margins that are just thin by biological necessity. But if you order an entire society where, well, basically, like if a if one plane doesn't land somewhere on time, the entire chain not like gets inconvenienced, but maybe the whole thing falls apart. That's yeah. when you start to have to ask radical questions about, you know, there's a difference between strength in optimal conditions and then robustness or uh, I mean, we're I'm cribbing from Nassim Nicholas Taleb, but like anti-fragility right. and in the face of, right. of, of, of difficulty. And so the, the point, I think it, it to me, it, it starts to be hard to understand anyone who would think different that like at the very least, right. Um, if we're going to, you know, honor the people who have died or lost their jobs at this time, at the very least, we, we owe it to them to take a hard look at why we were so susceptible to this kind of virus and why yeah. was our economy so susceptible to this sort of pause? That seems right. to me just honoring the dead. If yeah. we don't take the time to ask, how do we do a better job of making it where we're not so open to such a disease, A, and then B, that we're not so open to catastrophic disruption, overdoing the right thing, B, yeah. what, 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 then we're, we're not honoring the people that have been hurt most about these things yeah. and, and that starts to be I, I think what what i read your article that, like the the fear makes us go well let's just make it exactly how it was because that makes me feel comfortable it would be so comfortable exactly. right now just to be january 15th again but yes. if we're going to live in honor of the people who will never live comfortably again because either they're dead or their jobs are comp- gone away forever we have right. to be unafraid to ask, what can we do different this time? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think, um, yeah. So that's, that's going to be one of the big things is, um, you know, to what extent is there a kind of, you know, there's the panic of, there's the panic of shutting everything down. But as you said, Bo, there's also the panic of, we must get back to the way things were. And that, that is just as much a kind of fear, just as much a kind of panic that uh, um, as uh, as as panic over the virus itself, and um, and, and potentially just as damaging uh, in in a in, in a different way. But um, yeah, I, I think you know we we need to recognize that there is in life there are natural trade offs. There's natural trade offs between um, um, you know the thing I talk, wrote about in the article. There's a natural trade off between um, living fully and living safely. We, what we did was, was sublimate that. We, we thought that we had basically conquered that trade-off, that we could live fully and safely. And now all of a sudden, we are faced with that trade-off reemerging. Um, and, uh, and, and so we have to, but, but the, the, the intellectual and moral and political muscles that are needed to comprehend and to deal with that trade-off have atrophied because we're so used to things being completely sterile, completely safe. And so our natural response is to lean into safety, lean into sterility. Um, But what we really need to do is figure out how to reach a new equilibrium, how to um, how to come to terms with the fact that for the foreseeable future, 
the world will be more dangerous than it was, and was always more dangerous than we thought it was, than we led yeah, ourselves I, to believe. I actually think that that's one of the big takeaways that we're going to have after all of this is you go actually look at, I mean, we're all data analysts now because everybody keeps sending us like numbers <laughs> and charts, but yeah. You know, you go, oh, wow, 18 to 30 whatever year olds are actually dying at a far, 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 far lower rate because they're not doing all the things that usually get them killed. I mean, it's actually startling to see how many 18 to 29 year olds are actually living, you know, on average longer than like compared to months last year, not because like COVID's not a real threat. But because they're simply not on the road or they're not right. drinking at a spring break or whatever it might be. Uh-huh. And, uh, and and so it's you're right. I think part of this we're getting ready to go to the break. So, like, unfortunately, we yeah. like I'm, I'm so we're, we'll pin this before we, when we get back. But but like you said, a lot of this is just strictly the narrative. We said it yeah. was safe because we coded some deaths as freak accidents, but everything right. else is under control. But the actual fact of the matter is, it's if you use roads, people will get in wrecks. Uh, if yep. you walk about in the biological world, microbes will infect you. And so yep. that starts to be, I think that, that that's something that when we get back to the break, we can jump off on that about the narrative and how that might actually play into the Pope's Irby at Orby speech. So sure. uh, that's Brandon McGinley we're talking to. This is Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr on The Uncommon Good. We're glad to have you on this wintry Wednesday. And uh, we look forward to talking to you. This is The Uncommon Good. We'll be back right after this break. Back with The Uncommon Good. Bob Bonner and Dr. Bud Mara joining you this Wednesday. Happy Easter. Happy Easter tide. Make sure to celebrate the feast. And thank you for joining us on the show. Our guest is Brandon McGinley. Super all-star of The Uncommon Good, been on multiple times. You should go back in the archives and listen to the old ones when you get a chance. Uh, writer, prolific writer all over the place. You can go to his website, BrandonMcGinley.com. But we're specifically talking about two of his articles that just came out recently on Mere Orthodoxy. Brandon, thank you for coming back on the show. Yep, no problem, though. Uh, I realize that also um, maybe maybe people will find one of the, the old episodes that we did. One of my favorites, a little discomforting, because I said that Catholicism should be infectious, like a nasty rash. And, uh, <laughs> you and I were really like vibing on that one. So maybe maybe hold off for a few months on that one. Uh, uh, so, um, right. So so we've been talking about, you know, fear, fear underlying the narratives of how not only we deal with COVID-19, but life itself uh, uh, and, uh, you know, even even talking about how the numbers show that life was always more uh, deadly. Uh, of course, everybody dies, but even the sort of like dangers inherent um, than we than we than we talked about nowadays. But that this is all bringing things into new perspective. But I know that you wanted to uh, bring a local angle to that. So I throw it over to you. No, I was <clears throat> Brandon. I, I am interested to transition to the article that you wrote about the Pope's uh, Irby at Orby message. And I, I think this is related. So um, I, I think in a good way, this has kind of pressed Catholics to discuss the, the goods we have in common and how we, we organize even our communal life. So I know on my social media timelines, there's been a lot of debate about the best way for the Catholic church to respond in this context. And yeah. uh, your, your article that you wrote for mere orthodoxy really gets into, I, I think what we call like the global witness of the church but I was just curious, like, I, I know down in Brookline, uh, you live in close contact and community with, with several other Catholic families. And how have, you, how have you all been processing just like, you know, when the news first started to broke and as it developed and sort of like, do we go to confession? Do we go to mass? What is that? What does it look like to be the Catholic church in this in this place? Yeah, yeah, I think. um yeah, that's probably the, the, you know, of all the changes in my life, it's probably the most dramatic. You know, we, I work, I work from home, I write from home, my wife stays home. So in some ways, my life hasn't changed as much as others uh, have. But the big thing is the, the there's no opportunity for um, spontaneity. Everything is, um, everything has to be uh, kind of, uh, you know, if, if we see anybody, it has to be kind of, you know, planned in a specific way. We've got hiking and whatnot, but... For us, um, we've tried to figure out ways 
to safely, both in terms of the actual virus and in terms of not scandalizing people, um, to safely see one another. So I, I think um, the the cool the cool the coolest thing uh, we did was on Easter. Several families walked through the neighborhood at a distance from one another, staggered across the street. We probably have probably six or seven families that you know staggered, took up like half a block on each side of the street, and just sang Easter hymns. And some of, some of the older kids were carrying large icons, things like that. Um, and so that was a way to 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 celebrate the day, to celebrate Christ's resurrection, to do so publicly in a way that liturgy is. Public, even if it's behind closed doors, it's still public. Um, and so that was a little something that got us, we saw one another, we were able to speak to one another at a distance, but then also to witness to the faith. Um, on We had hoped to do the same thing on Palm Sunday, but um, we ended up just, just walking around uh, the block here, just our family with palms, and, you know, and we're singing. And so just, you know, little things like that have... Um, it's been an opportunity for creativity. I'll just I'll put it that way. Which which is you know I, I maybe sometimes too relentlessly um, you know glass half full and that would be another example of that is this has been an opportunity for people as communities, but especially even just as their individual families to be liturgically and prayerfully creative about um, how they can keep the time and celebrate the season, celebrate the um, celebrate Christ. Uh, in a way that is um, uh, that is suited to to your to your family to your community. Yeah, you know, Brandon. I, on that regard, I know you're saying it with uh, maybe you're being like glass too full. Uh, you know, whatever. <laughs> I, and and, I, and I've heard people say this. It, it's certainly true that this crisis is very much there's class differentiation in it. If you're working yeah. class you know, what we, what creativity will mean is like, how will I creatively even make money? You know, right, or, right. you know, how, how, am, how am I going to creatively, uh, you know, decontaminate myself when I get home so that like my kids don't get it. Like, so I, I'm not Absolutely. like throwing aspersion on all of these things like this, but another way to put this is even still the creativity is sort of like you have to do that because you can't just sit around and wait for the experts to figure this out. Because on one right. hand, as we're all learning, uh, we've been in many ways, this is, this is, we, I'm glad it's being recorded because Bo rarely says this. You got to feel bad for the experts a little bit because we've, <laughs> we've acted like we've acted like they have it all under control. And hopefully this has shown us right that even though there's reasons they're experts and that they do have an expertise, there are things in this world that they, they don't have a handle on before they happen. I mean, right. in some ways, if we'll be charitable and if you're doing things like following like these scientists on Twitter or the doctors in, in real time, you can basically see them trying to unravel the mystery of what's going on. And in some ways, you would hope this would humanize people. But then, of course, the completely countervailing force is where we do act like they are, you know, in an like really in an ivory tower. They that we have yeah. no say in this and that a lot of the council is just to sort of sit around and wait for the experts to figure it out. Well, unless the scientists are going to figure out how to give, you know, the ticks up in Pennsylvania COVID instead of us. Right. <laughs> like they're not going to have some sort of like grand slam where the light switch turns on and everything is hunky dory. Um, right. So I think people need to like, just deal with the fact of we really don't have a choice. You don't have to be glass half full. If you're not creative, you're going to be either bored or anxious out of your mind. And at some yeah. point I'm hoping that even if people have to hit a wall where they really just have a sort of like <laughs> interfamily short meltdown that they like you're getting at that past that wall, we can start to say there is a new world where we will just have to realize that what we were doing in April and May 2019 is not what we will be doing in 2020. Right, right, yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and, and, that, and, um, and, and, that that's, and that that's okay. But it's, but it's only, well, I should say that we have to respond integrally to that fact so it can't just be 
me and my family will adapt because you know I am a writer. I work from home. My situation is relatively stable, you know, for now. Thank thank goodness. Um, but how do we respond as a society to the fact that the situ the the economic and social situation in like you said, like November of 2020, is going to be different from what it was in November of 2019 in a radical way, and just sending people checks while it's something that I support is not is not going to be certainly certainly doing so on a one time basis um, is not going to be enough to, to to keep that to keep things the way they were, um, and so um, you know. For those whose situation is a lot more fragile than um, than for others, um, we need to figure out how we're going to create. And this is an a absolutely Herculean task. Uh, how do you how do you um, create a new equi- equilibrium, not just in terms of our psychological relationship with with fear and with danger and with the microbial world? But um, how do you create a new equilibrium that, um, you know, hopefully a better equilibrium for, for everybody to be able to not just survive in the basic biological sense, but thrive um, uh, in terms of, obviously, finances, but also in terms of the social life and leisure and so on. Like, uh, it is potentially, it is, well... It is potentially an opportunity to create something new and better. One has absolutely no reason to think that we are well positioned to create anything new and better, but one can hope. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, as we've been saying, you wrote this article about uh, the Pope's Urbi et Orbi yeah. blessing. And if I'm remembering correctly, he did that, uh, I, I believe, the Friday before Palm Sunday. But I know. Yeah. For myself and a a lot of Catholics around the world, for a moment, we felt uh, very united. And there was something just on a tangible level that was deeply moving, that the imagery and and the silence and the poignancy of the moment. But this is a really open-ended question, Brandon. I hope that's okay. But what did you personally find so compelling and moving about the Pope's actions that day? Yeah, I I just, I thought it was, I thought it was... um... First of all, it was just incredibly well staged, um, but not just, you know, you can stage something well for media and have in this kind of an implicit criticism I made of a lot of what Church has done, you know, you know, not not to pick on him, but like St. John Paul II did these out, outstanding kind of outrageous um, public spectacles that were incredibly well calibrated to mass media in the 1980s and so on, but um, they took on the the appearance of rallies or concerts, um, and were there were obviously mass, they were masses. They were they were legitimate Catholic events, but um, I, I feel like the like aesthetically, uh, they were more of just mass gatherings, you know, small m mass gatherings. Um, and what I saw on what I saw on uh, on that day of the Urbi at Urbi. You know, extraordinary blessing was um, something that was staged beautifully for modern mass media, but that was also completely within the Catholic aesthetic and liturgical idiom. Just one hundred percent, one hundred percent Catholic, and one hundred percent, you know, well, uh, well coordinated for for media, and um, it was so. It was so wonderful to see the church not just talking about faith, not just talking about Jesus, but literally offering Christ present in the Blessed Sacrament as a kind of, you know, as, a, as an oblation for, 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 for the world in the midst of the pandemic. We do this at every Mass. I mean, that's what, that's what the Mass is. But, um, but to see it done in that way... Um, to see it, uh, to see that kind of liturgical and aesthetic and dramatic, the drama of it, dramatic expression of faith, um, to me was the kind of integrity that we absolutely need from the church. Um, you know, one of the one of the points I made is that you know 
I, I think it's understated the extent to which recent popes have, have really challenged the modern world in their documents. Uh, in, in their encyclicals. I think, you know, someday we'll look back on the post conciliar era um, as being, you know, wishy-washy in some respects, but in terms of the actual words that were written down by the popes, um, it was actually very, very challenging. But that's what I see is, is incredibly anti-modern. I mean, um, maybe the most anti-modern papal intervention since the Council. Um, and, uh, but the posture, the drama of the Church uh, is too often, in my certainly, you know, in the in its kind of global sense, is too often, to my mind, um, more retiring, apologetic, unsure of itself. This was completely confident. This was we. This was you know what we do is yes, we do the corporal works of mercy. Yes, we do. Yes, we you know we do as as, as much as we can in terms of uh, in terms of social outreach, but. What we mostly do is kiss the feet of Christ. Mostly what we do is perform benediction. Mostly what we do is bless the entire world with Christ. Like, that, that is the kind of, that's the kind of like, integrated message in, in terms of the, the speech and liturgical drama that um, that should be, I think, a um, a template for for the church going forward. I, I think it was the you know in that in that regard, I think it was the you know, maybe the most import one of the most important events or one of the most important acts, um, public acts of the church, uh, certainly from Rome, um, maybe in my lifetime. Well, Brandon, I think that you you bring this point out maybe to tease it even more out is the message of the 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 homily that he gave that Pope Francis gave on one hand on the initial I mean this is perfect rhetorical everybody should figure out how to do this where on the surface and in a good way on the surface it was extremely comforting you know, this, yeah. the, like dwelling on like, aren't we on that boat with the apostles and the sea is churning and we're wondering yeah. like, what, where is Jesus? Why isn't he worried about us? Lord, you know, why aren't you worried about us? And then he goes, why are you afraid? You know, don't you know that I'll be there with you? And, you know, on, uh, so just on those words alone, you go, how comforting, right? Like even in this topsy-turvy boat, we find ourselves in the modern world. You know, the Lord is with us and like, you know, we, we need to remember that. And he even is sort of like encouraging us, right? The very fact that you go and ask Jesus, why are, you know, why aren't you worried? Like, why are, why are you not worried that we perish? That even shows, right, that you have faith, right? So in all these ways, very comforting. Underneath it, it's one of the most biting critiques of the modern world that he uses that biblical scene to say, almost to say, modern man, you've created this boat and you've right. created the storm. If you were so confident before, why are you afraid now? And so then we have to ask ourselves, well, maybe the reason we're so afraid is because if we're just honest about it, we realize we're radically not in control, that we, we've, we've yeah. made a boat that we can't steer. And yeah. that sort of, you know, it, it's like the, that's, you, you, there's medicines, right, that are long release, right? So they, like their, their real mm -hmm. effect is, is later. And... I think this ties back to everything that we were saying before, and especially in the first part of the show is you made a boat where you think that there's no, there's no storm that you can't surpass, but actually you've been sloughing off things at the side. People have been dying. People have been brutalized. People have been assaulted. There's all sorts of horrible things in the world, but because yeah. you can sanitize the four feet in front of you, you've acted yep. like you've made this perfect ship. Uh, but now yep. the, a storm that you can't deal with is here. And now you're back asking me for help. Like I don't yeah. care. It's brilliant. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm the way you pointed it out. Fantastic. I think everybody needs to read that and take that criticism deep in their heart. Yeah. I mean, there, I, you know, the, the Holy father is, he's, you know, his, 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 um, his tone is, is, is generally very gentle. Um, I, when I, you know, long story short, when I when I watched it, the the feed that I found was the raw Italian, and so I didn't know what he was saying. 
I only read it afterwards. And so I read it as an essay, which gave me a bit of a different perspective, I think. I think if you heard like the live translation, it maybe sounded a bit softer, a little bit nicer. When I read it as an essay, it felt um, it, there was almost taunting aspect to it, where he keeps returning to that refrain of, why are you afraid? Have you no faith? He talks about how, um, just like you said, Bo, like, um, how can we, how, how dare we expect not to not to have to deal with things like this whenever we have built a, a civilization of injustice, um, both in terms of the economy and in terms of the environment. Um, I mean, it's very, uh, it's it's extremely challenging. And uh, but again, it's not it's, it's not you know he, he can be caricatured for being too focused on the temporal. But you know what's the refrain? The refrain is it's a return, it's a call to re- return to faith. The if there's one main theme we can take away from the social teaching of this pontificate, it is that the world is kind of terminally out of sync, especially, quote-unquote, advanced Western civilization is terminally out of sync with the divine order. And that is a deeply Catholic and deeply challenging insight, um, and one that, again, I think that right now we're so used to, to... We're so used to pigeonholing everybody and categorizing them in terms of modern political ideologies... I think 100 years from now, 200 years from now, we're going to look back on a lot of these teachings, um, including, you know, JP2 and certainly Benedict and and definitely Francis, as being, um, uh, when when we read, when we just read the words that they wrote and the words that they spoke, I think we're going to see this as being uh, uh, a surprisingly, to our our mind right now, prophetic era in terms of uh, the Church's confrontation of uh, of post-modernity. Brandon, uh, I, I think you're great, and uh, uh, you're exactly right, and this is great, and I wish we could keep going. We're butting up <laughs> against time here, so we're going to have to let you go. Real quick, can you tell people where they can find your work so they can uh, keep reading uh, your brilliant commentary on all this? <laughs> yeah, thanks, thanks, Bo. Yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm just, uh, you know, I'm at brandonmcginley.com, my website. You can follow me on Twitter, uh, Brandon, at Brandon, at Brandon McG, B-R-A-N, D-O-N-M-C-G, and, uh, and yeah, from there you can kind of find uh, all my other stuff that I'm up to. Well, uh, we, we always love having you on the show. God bless. Happy Easter. Make sure, like I said, celebrate the feast, my friend. Absolutely. Uh, yep. I hope you do as well. Thanks, Brian. All right. All right. Well, this is the Uncommon Good. May Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, reign in our hearts, in our families, our city, our state, our nation, the world, the solar system, galaxy, the whole kit and caboodle. This is The Uncommon Good. We'll be back next week. The Uncommon Good with Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr is heard every week on wonderful Catholic stations like this one and anytime on podcasts. Just search for The Uncommon Good.